Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. And thanks also to the organizers. Uh, this has been a really lovely conference, um, and I'm honored to be here. So my name is Joseph DeVogais, and I'm here with the KDE Eco Project. Um, the uh, title of my talk is Free Software is Sustainable Software. Um, that is, we are already are sustainable, um, and there's many ways that we can um, do more. Uh, yesterday was Earth Day, uh, 22nd of April, so we can celebrate together uh, one day late. If you want to download the slides, I have a lot of references and links in them. Um, you can download them at our GitLab repository at invent.kde.org slash team slash eco slash BE for FOSS. That stands for Blaue Engel for FOSS, um, which I'll talk a bit more about in just a second. I will also repeat this link at the end of the talk if you decide at the end you want to download the, uh, the slides. So um, last year in 2021, KDE celebrated its 25th birthday. Uh, it started in 1996, um, and today it's much more than just a cool desktop environment. Um, it's a international community of developers and creators um, that are working on various cross-platform apps um, like Ocular, G Compre, Kate, etc. And um, about five or six years ago, there was a discussion about what is the vision that KDE has for the future. Um, what, what do they, um, as a community, what do we want to achieve? Um, and they came up with uh, this sentence, a world in which everyone has control over their digital life and enjoys freedom and privacy. And I'm gonna unpack that a little bit. Um, so the first part, a world in which everyone uh, has control over their digital life. So this is for everyone. This isn't for a subset of, of uh, society. This is for everybody in it. Um, as the, um, they stated at the website, uh, we don't want to hand control over to anybody else. KDE wants to put you in the driver's seat. And how can KDE do this? They can do this because they develop free and open source software, right? Free um, gives uh, the users uh, the control. Open source makes the code transparent and uh, accessible to everyone. And these are gonna be the two main pillars that I'm gonna talk about throughout the talk, um, user autonomy and transparency. The consequence of this user autonomy and this transparency is that users enjoy freedom and privacy. So without the freedom to make changes and share them, users are entirely reliant on the vendor's benevolence for apparent control. So when you're using non-free software, you might have options that make you feel like you have control, but in the end, the companies and the developers working for them decide what actually is done with that software. With FOSS, uh, user autonomy isn't a feature, right? It's inherent to uh, free and open source software. Privacy is a result of these freedoms and of the transparency. Many of you probably know Kirchhoff's principle um, that a uh, 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 cryptographic system um, should be as transparent as possible except for the private key, right? And that's what makes it robust. Um, security through obscurity is not real security. Right, so as a consequence of being free and open source, we enjoy freedom and privacy. Um, I want to add to that, and we create sustainable software. Okay, and that's gonna be the rest of the talk, um, thinking about these two pillars of transparency and user autonomy, how that already puts free and open source software at the forefront of sustainable software design. Um, this is not just me standing here telling you this. Um, recently, in 2020, the German government released a um, award criteria to label software as uh, um, uh, eco-friendly through the Blue Angel, the Blaue Engel. Who here is familiar with the Blaue Engel? Um, I'm just curious, uh, what do you know it from? Which products? Mostly, most people know it from paper, right? And mostly toilet paper. Um, but they do a lot more than just uh, paper uh, eco-certification. Um, and they've added to that now um, software. And uh, part of the project uh, that I'm working for, the Blau Angle for FOSS, is trying to spread information to the Blau Angle um, and how to uh, be compliant with it. Um, but we want to do much more than that. And that's another project that's part of the KDE Eco um, um, initiative, um, which is looking to measure energy consumption, drive down energy consumption of software, and whatnot. 
Um, there's many ways that you can help if you're inspired um, while listening to this. Um, we want to develop tools to automate the uh, measurement process. Um, we have sprints planned to set up a community lab um, to do a measure-a-thon. Um, if you're developing software and you want to measure and find out what the energy consumption of your software is, please be in touch. Um, you can collaborate uh, with other people interested in the topic of free software and sustainability at our mailing list and our matrix room, and I'll have more on this in just a minute. Um, first, to get an overview of the issues. Um, uh, the talk this morning from uh, Brigitte Lutz um, made me aware of the uh, Open Data Initiative in Austria, um, and I stumbled upon this. Uh, um, so this is from the Data Initiative, Open Data Initiative, and that led me to this website, um, which shows the greenhouse gas emissions of various countries per capita. Um, and um, here's the USA, uh, Germany, Austria, all of which are above the global average. Uh, the, uh, there's in a report um, from 2021 from the Association for Computing Machinery, um, which estimates that the ICT sector contributes about uh, 1.8 to 2.8 percent greenhouse gas emissions um, globally. Um, as a point of comparison, the global aviation industry um, is estimated at about 2.5 percent. So we're in the same um, area. What's contributing to that? Um, so um, this is from the SHIFT project. It's a French nonprofit um, which is uh, aiming to limit the effects of climate change and dependency on fossil fuels. And they released an analysis. Um, this is from 2017, so pre-pandemic data. I'm sure it looks a little different today. Um, where on the upper right, you see here production, um, energy consumption. This doesn't include transportation. Um, and it's about a little under half, so about 45%. Um, of the energy consumption in the ICT sector is from the production of devices, um, TVs, computers, tablets, smartphones, etc. The other 55% is in the usage. Um, data centers, uh, networks, so when you're sending uh, traffic over the internet, uh, and terminals here refers to um, all those devices, computers, tablets, uh, smartphones. And that accounts for about 55% of the energy consumption. Um, I'm not going to talk about data centers today, and I'm only going to indirectly refer to network uh, um, uh, energy consumption. Um, everything else I'm going to talk about is related to uh, terminal usage and uh, production. And I want to talk about it in three different ways. Um, energy efficiency, that is achieving the same results, um, but demanding less from hardware, in the case of software. Um, so every time a software uh, runs some command, it's going to demand energy from the hardware, right? That's, um, and conservation is um, reducing or eliminating unnecessary processes so that they're not there in the first place. And then energy sources, I'm going to talk about maximizing renewable energy sources. So first, uh, thinking about energy efficiency. Um, I'm a, before I get to the graph, I'm going to read a quote from the Blue Angel Award Criteria. They write um, about software bloat. The availability of more and more powerful hardware has resulted in software becoming more and more bloated from version to version so that more resources are required for only minimal or even no enhancement of the functionality. Let's take a look at what this might mean. I'm going to focus on the two left bar plots here. Um, this is from a report from the German Environment Agency comparing different software products doing the exact same thing. Um, I'm going to only look at the text editors on the far left. Um, this is word processor 1 in the green and word processor 2 in the blue. Um, these are popular uh, uh, text editors. They're not specified in the report. Um, and you can see here that word processor 1 doing the exact same thing, getting the exact same results, consumes about four times the energy than uh, the word processor 2. Now, for an individual user, this might be trivial, um, but there's a saying, think local, act global, right? Uh, when you multiply this by millions, possibly hundreds of millions, possibly billions of users, every office, every student, every home uses text editors, the numbers add up. 
thinking about in terms of energy conservation, this is from a talk uh, from the CCC in 2019 from Mania Kuhn and Eva Kahn. Um, I'm not going to go into details about the graphs. Again, it's comparing two text editors. Um, it's from uh, similar research. And uh, I want to focus just on this red line here. This red line is the point at which the document is saved and the application goes idle or should go idle. What you can see here is that one text editor you know, performs the task of saving and then goes to a baseline energy consumption. The other text editor saves and then continues doing things in the background. What it's doing, uh, it's not specified. Is it phoning home? Um, is it you know, collecting data, telemetry data of some form, et cetera? Are these tasks necessary for the functionality of the software? Do users have a choice that they actually are running these tasks in the background? That's one aspect of conservation, so running unnecessary tasks. Um, another is uh, software-driven hardware obsolescence. Um, some of you may have friends or family, I know I have, uh, who receive when they're trying to do an update on their you know, uh, widely used operating system, and uh, a laptop that they bought just a couple of years ago says, device doesn't meet minimum system requirements. Right? So they can't update to the newest operating system, um, and they have a choice, either continue using an unsupported uh, uh, piece of hardware um, and keep using it, or they discard it as e-waste e um, and buy a new one. That's the choices they think they have until they talk to me and I say, well, you can try using a minimal operating, a more minimal operating system, a GNU Linux operating system, and many have switched and are very happy with the switch. Um, the result of this is that new devices are produced. Remember, production is about 45% of the energy consumption um, and shipped unnecessarily. And then you end up with uh, something like the, the Wii person this is a statue, uh, the Waste Electrical and Electronic Equipment person. It's a statue built out of discarded e-waste um, from the um, average UK citizen's uh, um, uh, device consumption. Um, it's seven meters tall and weighs 3.3 tons. And the third uh, aspect, as I would talk about, is, is uh, energy sources. And this is a graph from a talk um, that I saw just a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is on the y-axis, the renewable power supply. On the x-axis, the time of day. And you can see there's sort of a baseline renewable energy uh, uh, source. Um, but at certain times of day, there's more available energy coming from renewable sources. OK, so um, what does this have to do with free and open source software? So I'm going to start with uh, the um, observation that FOSS is, is socially oriented, right? It empowers users and empowers communities of users. So we can go back to the, the different uh, aspects of energy consumption. When we think about energy efficiency, so the first thing is we can take that transparency that we're already doing in, in the free and open source software community, and we can now include energy consumption in that transparency. We can measure our software, find out how much energy it's consuming, publish this data with our uh, software releases, so that um, hopefully we can drive down the energy consumption. The first step to uh, driving down the energy consumption is knowing how much it consumes. And second, uh, users are then given um, the ability to make informed choices about the software they're using. If you don't know that the software you're using is consuming four times as much, uh, you don't know which software product you want to choose um, if you're concerned about uh, the, um, the climate. Um, efficiency comes in many forms. We have a, a nice example at KDE just from about a week and a half ago, uh, G Compre, it's um, an e-learning um, tool for children. Um, the, uh, one of the developers asked if they could increase uh, the resolution of the images used. Um, at first, they were hesitant because hesitant they thought this would increase the size of the overall package and their data set. Um, they looked into it, and they discovered that they can convert it to a different format, get better resolution on the images, and decrease their overall package size and data set by 30%. Right? What does this have to do with energy consumption? Well, if you um, are 
uh, uh, downloading it from the internet, if you've reduced the size of it, um, this is uh, going to then c uh, consume less energy in the download process. Um, it also has uh, other benefits, like if you live in a country that doesn't have uh, stable internet conne connections or good internet connect connections, um, this will make it easier to then access this software. Um, again, one uh, application might not make a big difference, but if, if we start doing this for hundreds of applications, thousands of applications, this can make a difference. Think locally, um, act globally. Sorry, act locally, think globally. What's nice about software, actually, is that you can act locally and globally, because once you make that change locally and you distribute it, it actually does have an effect globally. Um, thinking about the uh, unnecessary processes um, that's happening here that has nothing to do with the functionality of the software. Um, with free and open source software, uh, if a user doesn't want this, um, if a developer um, is made aware that, that they don't want this, they can change this. Um, you can't do that with non-free software. You're at the hands of the companies and they have their own interests in whatever is happening here, potentially. Um, and um, users can be given uh, choices about do they want this? So we can develop software that says, okay, we, we have the option. Um, I, I believe this is uh, how it is at KDE. Um, we have you know, a, a telemetry option that's off by default. You can say, I'm, o I want, I'm okay with this. I want to share this data to improve the software. Um, but you can also choose not to, um, which means you have a direct influence on what processes are running when you're running that software. That sort of user autonomy is part of free and open source software. And perhaps the most impactful um, when thinking about the energy consumption in that pie chart. Um, so one of the main drivers, according to that shift report that uh, presented this pie chart, one of the main drivers is the short lifespan of hardware. So with free software, we can choose to continue to support devices uh, as long as we want. Uh, we can uh, prevent um, uh, the hardware being unusable because of software bloat and feature creep. We can make it so users have a choice uh, to uh, continue using that hardware if they want to, right? I, I use hardware that's um, well over uh, uh, 10 years old um, and have no problem with it because I'm running a minimal Linux uh, system on it, right? That's possible. You can't do that. Um, you know, I, I remember uh, taking an old power PC that someone was discarding, uh, installing Debian on it. Um, you can do that with a power PC uh, with free software. You can't do that with any of the non-free alternatives. Right? And maybe we can make this wee person shorter and way less in the future. Um, and uh, getting to renewable energy sources, um, there are tasks that are shiftable. And this information is available. Uh, you can see for Europe um, the, the, which energy sources are currently contributing to uh, the energy supply. Um, we can take this data and we can uh, design our software to shift tasks that are shiftable to times of day when we have more renewable energy sources, reducing the um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, something like uh, software updates. So FOSS empowers us uh, to, make, to, to make these changes, um, and we can find new and creative ways to further uh, make software more sustainable. Um, the rest of my talk now is going to be thinking about how the transparency and user autonomy um, is already uh, sustainable, and this is recognized by the Blaue Engel uh, Award Criteria for Software released in 2020, um, which... Um, is broken up into three main categories. Uh, resource and energy efficiency is category one. Uh, potential hardware operating life um, is the second category, and user autonomy is the third category. Um, to get an idea of what that means, um, the resource and energy efficiency uh, is related to the hardware performance. If you think back to the, that first bar plot, comparing the two text editors, the green and the blue, 
Um, it's related to how much energy does the software consume when running a standard usage scenario. Um, the potential hardware operating life for compliance with the Blue Angel, you have to demonstrate that it can run on, um, that your software product can run on hardware that's at least five years old. Um, this is trivial, in my opinion. 2017 is not that long ago. I think most free software can run on uh, hardware from 2017. Um, but this is uh, their uh, regulations. Um, nonetheless, for other software developers, I think it's good to start pushing uh, this idea of backwards compatibility with hardware. And then user autonomy is really where free software um, has a huge advantage. Um, part of the compliance with the uh, criteria um, requires documentation of uninstallability. This is something we take totally for granted, right? This is this is uh, might seem s almost silly, but the idea that you can completely uninstall a software uh, product um, when you're using um, other software products is not a given, right? In free software, you just have to give a command and it's gone. Um, modular modularity: can you install only what you need and not other features? or aspects of the software that are not relevant for what you need from that software product. Um, documentation of support for open standards, interoperability, things like this. Transparency, um, open source, you don't have to be open source to be Blue Angel compliant, um, but uh, you need to show some sort of plan for what you do when the product is at its end of life. Will you then release the source code so other people can continue to develop it if they want? Support for transparent APIs, uh, continuity of support. Do you provide uh, security updates so you don't get the message uh, that this software is no longer supported or this device is no longer supported? Um, and then can a user use the software product without having unnecessary tasks running like advertising? Um, so the... Um, one thing to observe right away is that everything below this big red sentence here, criteria that FOSS is already fulfilling, we just need documentation. FOSS has a huge advantage. We're already doing many of these things. And so the rest of this part of the talk, I'm going to focus on um, measuring the hardware performance and energy consumption of software. So there are three steps if, if one is interested in uh, obtaining eco-certification with the Blue Angel for uh, your free software product. Um, you have to measure it, get the data about how much energy it consumes. You analyze the data. There's a tool that's already been developed called OSCAR, the Open Source Software Consumption Analysis in R, um, and then certify it by fulfilling, out, uh, fulfilling all of the uh, documentation. How do you measure software? Um, there's a lab setup um, here. Uh, there's the system under test, which is the, the uh, hardware that you're testing your software product on, um, which is connected to a power meter, and both are connected to a data aggregator. Um, the uh, power meter is an external uh, a power meter measuring the consumption while running um, the usage scenario. And... Um, all this data is then analyzed, collected, and then analyzed on your data aggregator, your third, your second computer. Um, power meters are not cheap. A uh, professional power meter, like the one that's recommended by the Blau Engel, is probably easily 350, 400 euros at least. Um, they're, you know, you get uh, a, a pretty high resolution, a thousand uh, data points per second. Um, a, uh, a KDE community member, um, Volker Kauza, um, hacked a power plug, um, costs about eight euros. Um, and you can also use this as a power meter uh, running free software. Um, you can uh, go to the uh, blog post about it and follow the steps and do this yourself. Um, and um, you don't get the same resolution. It's about five data points per second, but it's nonetheless a um, uh, worthwhile uh, uh, checking out what your software consumes if you want to just get an idea of, of what your uh, power consumption is. So uh, what do you measure? You measure the energy consumption. This is the recommended, one of the recommended power meters um, from the Blue Angel. Um, and the hardware performance, that is the CPU, memory, disk, and network data, um, one thing I think many uh, developers already know is that CPU is a good indicator of power consumption. Um, you can actually see this in the data. 
um, that the uh, graphs are um, um, very, very close in shape. Um, there are three scenarios that you need to measure if you want to do um, Blue Angel certification. Um, that's the baseline, that is how much power does your operating system consume. Um, the idle mode, which is how much power does the software product that you're testing consume when it's not doing anything. And then your standard uses scenario, that is uh, when using the software in a typical way, how much energy does it consume. Um, this is a nice little graph or uh, um, uh, image from our season of KDE student, Karan Jout uh, Singh. Um, he uh, um, um, puts here the steps to preparing the standard usage scenario. He's preparing various standard usage scenarios for several text editors um, so that we can measure our measure a thon sometime in the summer. So you identify the tasks that users do when they, when they use the software, find the ones that are most typical, ones that might be most power hungry, um, create a flow chart. If you want to do Blue Angel certification, it has to be at least five minutes. Emulate these actions with a emulator, um, something like xdo tool and a bash script. That seems to be the one that's most popular in our community right now. Um, Axiona, it's a more click uh, um, based emulation tool. There are several others. Um, you script this and then test it in a lab. Once you have your uh, standard uses scenario, go to a lab, run it, and then you're going to get results. This is where, uh, if you want to do um, Blue Angel, this would be particularly helpful, is the uh, Oscar tool. It's the open source software consumption analysis and R tool. It's developed by the Umwelt Campus Birkenfeld. It has an online portal. You can upload your log file of actions, your energy consumption, and your hardware performance, and you get a nice uh, report back. Um, this is an example of the energy consumption um, when uh, using Kmail, the email client. Um, here you see the 31 repetitions in gray. Um, the spikes here uh, in the middle are when sending an email with an attachment, for example. Um, so once you've completed the hardware performance and energy consumption, as I said, you just need the documentation of everything else. And we're proud to announce that Ocular, the PDF and Universal Document Viewer, uh, was awarded the Blue Angel um, in February. It's the first software product from both the Blue Angel and the Global Eco Labeling Network. Uh, Global Eco Labeling Network is a network of 30 eco labels around the world, all Type 1 eco labels, and it represents over 50 countries. Um, we have uh, more software that we are going to submit. We have already, um, we're preparing Kmail, the email client, um, as well as the uh, natural painting program, Krita, which has been measured. We want to um, host a measure-a-thon sometime in the summer um, to measure Kate, uh, the text editor, and more, G Compre, the e-learning uh, software, as well as other software projects. Um, we're thinking about measuring um, some IDEs, uh, Cute Creator, uh, is one we want to measure. Um, if you have a software uh, product, um, if you're developing free and open source software, this is under the KDE umbrella, um, but it's a free and open source software project. We're here for all uh, FOSS developers. Um, if you're interested in looking at um, the applications for uh, Ocular as well as um, uh, Kmail, um, you can go to our GitLab repository and get all the data there. Um, just a couple of words before I wrap up. Um, what are some of the benefits of uh, receiving the Blue Angel? Um, so Blue Angel is generally considered to represent very high standards. Um, this also is the case internationally. Um, it differentiates free software from alternatives. I think more importantly, it, it promotes transparency in energy consumption in software. Um, and it uh, increases the appeal of adoption. So when you think of something like a green public procurement initiative, being eco-certified opens up new channels to communicate with governments uh, to um, encourage the adoption of, of uh, free software products, which provide the exact same functionality, um, but with a reduced environmental impact. 
um, and just briefly, uh, internationally, um, the Blue Angel um, uh, awards the eco certification to 15% of the recipients outside of Germany. So it's not just a German um, uh, uh, eco label. And there's no requirements on where a product is marketed. Other legal eco labels might require it to be marketed in that um, country where it's awarded. Uh, the Blue Angel does not. Um, it's uh, regarded as, as a mark of high quality. So I've, I've heard that companies when choosing which products to use um, will choose uh, Blue Angel just because it's considered a, a quality assurance. Um, and it's um, seen as a market indicator of the direction that the EU market is going in. Great. So just uh, wrapping up, um, and I would like to invite you to join our community um, to help make uh, free software the most sustainable software it can be. So uh, one of the first, uh, the nearest goals we have is a, a KDAB at KDAB Berlin. We want to set up a community lab to measure software. The vision is one day to have an upload portal where you can upload uh, your software. Um, you can upload your standard usage scenario, indicate which hardware requirements you have, and then get a report back. This is sort of the grand vision. Um, short term is just get the lab set up. Um, let's start there and then uh, move forward. Uh, we have a, a sprint planned uh, the 21st of May. If any of you are in Berlin, you're welcome to join. If you want to set up a lab in your own community, be in touch. Perhaps we can help um, uh, help you with that, um, whether it's uh, in terms of guidelines or if it's um, potentially even in terms of power meters and things like this. Um, so. More generally, if you are a software developer, we really want to encourage people to start measuring their software, publishing the results, and making energy consumption transparent. You can help us develop tools to automate the workflow of measuring software. Um, squashing efficiency bugs, things related to CPU spikes, delays, hangs, freezing. Um, we introduced the efficiency label uh, in um, uh, for our bugs uh, sometime in the fall, in 2021. We've now had, I think, if I remember correctly, 180 or is it 80? Anyway, we've had now several uh, bugs that have been squashed, labeled efficiency bugs. Um, provide support for stati statistical analysis tools like Oscar. Um, submit your own Blue Angel applications if you're interested. We have many more ideas that we're discussing in the community. At the last meetup, um, you can uh, see a discussion of various ideas that we have that we want to um, pursue. And then looking outward to some other projects uh, that are doing related work that might interest you. Um, the Sustainable Digital Infrastructure Alliance, SDIA, has a project called Soft Aware, and they are looking to develop uh, tools to integrate uh, energy consumption measurements into the CI pipeline. And they have various hackathons and workshops planned. Another project that's worth mentioning is the Upcycling Android project from the FSFA. Um, this is a project looking to uh, keep smartphone hardware uh, in use by installing free software on it. And um, if you're interested, please be in touch. If you'd like to get involved with our community, there are many ways to do so. So thank you. Yes. There is. So there already are some uh, uh, resources for that. Um, I know that there's from the Hasso Platna Institute in Potsdam. Um, they have a whole course on sustainable uh, software uh, development, um, and they include things like best practices. We also have the idea of organizing a sprint to get some senior developers together and come up with a sort of a 10 do's and 10 don'ts for uh, efficient software development. One thing to point out is many people are already thinking about efficiency, but they're often thinking about it on um, the other side, which is optimization and performance, um, which is not the exact same thing, but they're very uh, related, two sides of the same coin. Um, and so there are already developers who have 
best practice uh, ideas um, that, yes, that is definitely um, uh, planned at some point. Any other questions? Yeah. So the question is if, if there are other Linux organizations. Um, we are in touch with uh, GNOME and Qt um, to start working together to measure and uh, drive down the energy consumption of software. Um, uh, next week, there's the um, uh, co-organized Linux App Summit from GNOME and KDE. Uh, we'll talk about that further. Um, yeah, so yes, the answer to that is yes. We're, we're still in the beginning phases. The project, the Blau Angle for FOSS, just started in July of 2021, um, but it's definitely, um, yeah, that's a, that's a part of the plan is to spread out. Mm -hmm. uh, do you consider different operating systems when you're evaluating the power usage of a specific software? For example, running, I'm not sure if Popular runs on Windows, but for example, running Popular on Windows versus on Linux? So for the um, Blue Angel specifically, they have recommended operating systems that you can test it on. Um, uh, we are obviously going to be testing it on um, uh, Linux-based um, operating systems. They recommend Ubuntu um, for Linux. Um, the um, important thing, so one of the reasons that you have these three different uh, usage scenarios to measure, the operating system itself, uh, the application while idle, and then the application while in use, is so that you can um, uh, uh, um, subtract out the energy consumption that's coming, for example, from the operating system. The important thing, though, is that when you measure a um, piece of software is that you keep that consistent over time because otherwise the results may not be comparable. So it should be um, documented which operating system you're using and then um, be consistent when measuring software if you measure a future release to try to um, keep it as similar as possible so that uh, you're not influencing the results. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, there is definitely an, a factor of the operating system that's um, super important to consider. Yeah. Um, yeah, please. So unfortunately, I'm not the best person to ask um, to answer that question. There are people in the, um, so the question is, um, uh, how do we factor um, uh, um, accelera acceleration um, into the energy efficiency of um, a software product? And um, I know there are people looking at that. And in fact, it seems like um, depending on what you're doing, there are different components that you want to delegate to, um, whether it's GPU or CPU, et cetera. Um, but I, I'm not the best person to ask, but that's something you can certainly um, go to the matrix room and there will be someone who can give you a satisfactory answer there. Um, yeah. So thank you for that question. So the question is if, um, if there's a threshold, basically, does the Blue Angel have a threshold? It has to be under a certain amount of energy consumption to be awarded. At the moment, no. At the moment, it's about transparency in the energy consumption, um, and there's no minimal uh, threshold. Um, they might change it in the future, and they are considering ways to um, um, extend the uh, award criteria, um, also beyond just desktop software. Uh, but right at the moment, no, it's not a, a uh, it doesn't have to meet a minimum. Yeah.
So the question is if there's anything, for example, at the EU level to require um, some transparency report on devices, um, some sort of labeling. Um, as far as I know, no, um, but I'm not, uh, I'm not aware of all uh, things going on at the EU level or the government level related to that. The, sec the first question was? Okay, the qu um, iPhone, uh, iPhone or, or Android phone So the question is if there's any resistance um, to, uh, to these initiatives, um, you know, the Blue Angel or the Kitty Eco from companies, uh, not yet. Um, I would say I hope we do at some point because then I think we're really being effective, um, but not yet. Yeah. So I recently uh, heard that. So I think it could make a difference uh, how the standard library, for example, the C standard library, is compiled with which optimization level, and different distributions ship different optimization level compiled standard libraries. How much uh, how much of the burden do you think falls on distributions to also perhaps increase this level of optimization to? to reduce energy costs? So again, I'm not the best person to ask, and I would want to encourage you to join um, one of our uh, uh, communication channels and ask uh, these kinds of questions. I mean, I, I would say if the question is how much burden should there be, I think we should do everything we can um, to reduce the uh, uh, footprint of uh, what we're doing in general and including software. Um, yeah, that's the, the best I can answer right now. Are there any plans on how to involve more, let's call them unaware people? Because I've noticed that there's like a core, uh, some people that are acutely aware, but a, uh, let's call them silent majority that aren't aware about energy problems or alternative operating systems, how to operate them, how to set them up. Um, is there an initiative how we could involve more people in this, make them more aware of that? So how do we get as many people involved as possible? And yeah, so right now, I mean, we're, we're uh, so, so maybe I'll say a couple of things to this. Um, we don't want to greenwash, right? So we're not just trying to push out a narrative without actually getting data. So part of the work right now is getting this community lab set up and to start measuring software. Um, and to focus on things that are uh, third party, uh, um, uh, compliance, things like eco labels, um, give us a way to um, show that we're not just trying to make it sound like we care about these things, but we're actually making it um, steps towards uh, um, yeah, uh, doing things that will hopefully uh, make our software ultimately more sustainable over time. Um, so that's where the focus has been mostly uh, up to this point. Um, I put the slides on this page. So when we got the Blue Angel certification, um, that we feel this gave us an opportunity to reach out to networks that we might not normally be able to reach. Um, uh, it got publication, for example, in the TOTS, uh, a German newspaper, um, and trying to um, uh, make people aware outside of the normal free and open source software communities about these initiatives. And that's one way to start uh, um, bringing people into it. Um, so there's a, there is this sort of marketing component um, and that also includes things like social media and whatnot. Um, beyond that, at the moment, um, there is not. Um, we are involved for, in, with some other communities. There's um, a lot of work being done in sustainable software. There's a conference, an academic conference, which again is outside of the normal um, free and open source software communities, looking at sustainable software design. Kitty Eco is co-organizing co this. Um, so we're trying to get involved in these communities that um, this initiative gives us these channels into them that we didn't before. Of course, if, if you're inspired, if anyone in this uh, audience is inspired and would like to help us organize these kinds of events, we really want to encourage you to get involved.
So if you have ideas, write us. If you want to organize something, um, write us, and we can um, probably find ways to support you in that. So the operating system definitely is, uh, is uh, relevant, but also the choice of the um, language in which we are coding could be relevant. So if you're starting a new project, you, know, you consider a lot of things, so it's probably not the, the main criteria for choosing your language. Um, but um, it would be probably help to um, get some measurements what is good uh, or efficient in this language and what's not that good. So you have some to do some choices and yeah, but it can have a very big impact and also reducing this impact by for the language developers um, can be also important. Sure. So, I mean, uh, from what I understand, so I've had this conversation, uh, full disclosure, I'm not a developer. Um, I've had this conversation with people who are and they've said there's a lot of things we can do first before um, getting too involved with which we're using as the uh, primary contributor to energy inefficiency. Um, I know the SDIA with the software project is looking specifically at the libraries that are used because that can have a huge impact. Um, um, so there are people thinking about these things. Um, that said, uh, you know, regarding um, there are things we can do first um, that maybe have a big impact. I would also say no uh, um, improvement is too small once you start multiplying these. Um, by the numbers that we're talking about when we talk about software users, a small change can result in huge uh, chain, uh, differences. Um, there's a nice example of just uh, shaving off one CPU second. Um, for one user, you know, if 10 transactions a day over a working year um, might not be much, but when you multiply that by uh, 5 million users, suddenly you have the energy consumption of a small city. Right. So, so I. So, on the one hand, I'd say you know there are bigger things maybe to tackle first. On the other hand, no change is too small. So it's. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so languages are the multiplier. So everything is to to be written in the language. And well, you have some languages that are very, uh, very popular, uh, or the libraries that are very popular, and they are used everywhere, and they are downloaded everywhere. Um, even more. So um, there's probably a point uh, where you can add a lot of uh, efficiency and which can be relevant to choose this language or this library over another, um, which is very um, bottom on the uh, developing tree. So you can you cannot really change it later on that easily, but it will affect all you do later on in your project. Sure. And so, and if, if these are the kinds of things, so maybe uh, the um, allowing of a FOSS, um, so far has been focused on the, the desktop software, so the end product, um, once it's already there, and getting uh, information about the energy consumption there with the goal of um, hopefully driving down the energy consumption. But the SDIA, the software project, if this is a topic that interests you, they're specifically looking at the development process and energy consumption in the development process. Um, of course, this is something we can start doing also in KDE Eco, but right now that's not been the focus. Um, but there are projects already doing that, so... Um, if this interests you, also consider getting involved with them. Yeah. or start page of that and that social media platform, right? I mean, we're talking about having millions of servers and billions of users. A 1% change there is probably megawatt hours, right? Uh, in a day or something like that. Is there any initiative also to talk to those guys and make them aware? And I mean, for them, it's a cost factor, right? But maybe a cost is not their biggest driver, energy cost. But maybe there could be some kind of labeling and certification also for those. So, so specifically, um, that's not the area that we're working on. There, again, the SDIA, they have, it's, a, it's a very big project. The software is just the uh, software development project, but they have a digital carbon footprint project, which is looking specifically at, at uh, data centers um, and cloud computing and energy consumption there. It's not looking at the companies per se, um, but that's a place to look um, for people working on these kinds of questions. Any other questions? We can also talk in the break. Um, 
I always like to get to know people and know what they're working on. So feel free to, um, to talk with me if you see me walking around. Otherwise, I think we can uh, wrap it up here. So thank you very much. Um, and if you are interested, please be in touch. I'd love to hear from you.